My guest today is Michelle Frost. Michelle, how are you today? I'm doing well, David. How are you? I'm doing really well, considering it's Monday morning. I'm excited for the week. Tell me, what do you do for a living, Michelle? Well, David, um, I work as a senior software developer for um, CREMA. We're a design and technology consultancy based in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I also serve on the Ethical AI Council for the Center for Practical Bioethics. Um, and I love to teach developers about responsible tech. Excellent. And when I asked you to be on my show and what do you want to talk about, you suggested the topic of socio-technical approaches to artificial intelligence. And I don't know what that is. Tell me, what does that mean? Um, it's, I would say, a faucet to um, responsible AI, right? There's a lot of hype around um, RAI, okay. um, AI ethics, Um Sometimes I get a little bit nervous about More that hype, hype to be. I think. Yeah, it's there's a lot of people that are truly passionate about it, um, myself being one of them. Um, right now, it seems to be a bit of a craze, uh, and I hope that everybody is um, is deeply committed to it. Uh, and there's so many different aspects of responsible AI, right? Where we're, we're looking at privacy, we're looking at, at bias, we're looking at value alignment. Um, and how can we kind of combine all these different faucets and all these different elements? Uh, and, and we can do a lot of that by um, reframing how we think about responsible AI in terms of taking a socio-technical approach, meaning that this isn't just a technology problem. This is a social problem. This is a societal problem. And we need a lot of different people in the room um, in order to get to uh, the green pasture. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's true about almost any technology. Tech, people try to assign a value, like good versus evil technology, which is which is foolish. Technology is just a tool in the hands of good people and bad people, and it could be used for just about anything. AI is no different from that, I think. I would agree with that. I think what we're seeing with AI is that it moves very fast. Um, the development moves very fast and the results move very fast and it could have high reaching consequences in ways that um, other tools perhaps haven't had just yet. You mentioned earlier that you th think that we need a new approach to responsible AI, to the way we were thinking about responsible AI. Are, are we thinking about it in the wrong ways? I wouldn't say that we're thinking about it in the wrong ways necessarily, but I think what we, um, we need to do is, is, I don't want to say pause because there's no time to pause. There's no room to pause. But what we need to do is take a little bit of a breather, right? And um, understand not just, you know, where we are today, but um, the threads of history that have brought us here. And I think having a more holistic picture of the field of AI, the history of AI, so that we can understand where we're going. Um, a, a quote I like is uh, Martin Luther King. Um, we are not makers of history. We are made by history. Uh, and I think there's a lot of um, threads of that in uh, AI right now. Okay. And you mentioned uh, you mentioned the history of AI. Before we started recording, you said something about that the idea of AI has been around for thousands of years, which surprised me. Tell, speak to that a little bit, please. Yeah, you don't want uh, me to nerd out on this for too long. Um, but <laughs> we, we... Don't tell me what I want. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's fair. That's fair. Um, the, the term artificial intelligence was coined in 1956, um, but we can actually go back to mythology, um, to mythology from around the world, truthfully. And um, uh, in Homer's time, so around 750 BC, um, we have the myth okay. of Talos. Um, he was an ancient, a, a giant bronze man commissioned by Hephaestus um, to protect the island of Crete. And um, this is our first trace of the idea of a, a machine, of an artificial person um, with a task. Ah, so this 1956 is well after that. People were thinking about it. And of course, uh, the early 20th century, we saw a lot of movies. We saw a lot of maybe the late 19th century as well, books about thinking computers. Computers could think like, like people. Stories like uh, Metropolis, Fritz Lang. Yes, yes. And 
Um, you know, even even before that too, we have the entire field of um, early engineering of automata, of um, mechanical creatures like the um, monk who could walk across a table and beat its chest in contrition. I think that was, I'm going to misquote myself here, but 1500s, a Spanish clockmaker, Juanello Turinello. Um, In the 1700s, we had a bronze digesting duck, uh, Jacques de Vaucanson, um, that could walk (laughs) across the table again and uh, it shit bronze pellets. That was its task was to digest. <laughs> That's a superpower. <laughs> yeah, we we always seem to make silly things. I suppose even back then. Uh, all right. So, how does this history uh, relate to what we're talking about now? This idea that we're uh, the, uh, the AI is a social construct as well as a technology construct. I I think we have to look at the early goals of of why were early engineers, why were early philosophers, um, why was there literature and, um, and stories, you know, about making a machine like us. And, you know, I think it comes with a, a fascination of trying to understand ourselves, right? If we can replicate ourselves, then that must mean that we understand ourselves and asking, you know, what, what are we doing here? Um, and at some point, I think, you know, there's a, we're going to do it because we can uh, look at Frankenstein. I love that book. If you haven't read it recently, uh, um, it's, it's. I have. I, I reread it just about two years ago. It's so it's fascinating how much it applies to today, um, and I think if we can understand some of those early onset and ideas, um, then maybe we can ask if we're still on the right trajectory. If if we're shaping technology based off of old goals. Um, or if there's a new direction, do we truly want to make machines like us? Um, and, and should we be, uh, measuring our success by that replication? Um, for example, you know, anything related to the Turing test, right. is about tricking another human into thinking that a machine is human and, Um, you know, we beat chess, we beat go, uh, we can write a sonnet, we can write an email. Um, and are those the success metrics that we want to be using? Yeah. Well, that, and can we identify all the traffic lights in the photograph? Uh, what, so what are the specific questions that we should be asking ourselves as we try to tackle the problems of AI? Um, I, a lot of questions. All right. Just a few then. Please. So I, I think the first is there is always a can versus should we, right? And and okay. what, what is the benefit? And I, I think this also kind of comes into some fear of job displacement that there's always going to be some job displacement, right? Um, that's that's part of um, how our world works. Um, Certainly but, in the tech field, definitely, uh, it has been always true. Exactly. Um, in some cases, are those things that we should be replicating? You know, are we replacing um, things that people should be working on because they're they're inherently human? Um, or are we trying to build workflows that truly automate? Um, and I, I think that we want to be doing the latter. We want to be um, augmenting our capabilities, not necessarily replacing aspects like creativity, for example, or yeah. um, you know things that are inherently human. Yeah, uh, a job replacement, I've... I've... I've been experienced my whole career. There's always been some new technology that makes an old skill obsolete. And the, 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 my, my answer is always, you should have always have an eye on that and recognize when that's coming and keep your skills up, understand what the demand for skills is going to be five years from now, as well as what you're doing right now. The challenge with AI is, as you pointed out, it's moving so fast. It's hard to do that. It's hard to retrain if they're going to replace, if, if something in AI is going to challenge what you're doing now and potentially replace it. Do you have time to retrain, to rescale yourself? Yeah. And what I will say too, is I, I sometimes worry that we spend too much fear on the job displacement and on the, you know, the future of AGI or ASI, um, artificial general intelligence or artificial super intelligence and not enough time looking at today's problems. Um, and, and so there's, there's a balance, you know, to, yes. to finding that, um, there's a, a forecasting we've always gotten wrong, 
you know, it's like the, the weathermen, which they're actually doing better now, thanks to AI. Um, but if we try to <laughs> forecast down the road of what's going to be replaced, uh, that's historically, we've been very bad at that. Uh, true. Um, so what, what are some of the other questions we should be asking ourselves? Can versus should is one? Can versus should. Do we have the right people in the room? Um, and I would say that that's a little bit more of a proactive versus reactive approach to AI governance is making sure that we have the right people in the room as we're building the products. Um, meaning that before, um, you know, before we start coding, before we start building models, have we consulted the right people? Have we talked to domain experts? Um, in, in the case of healthcare, for example, um, you know, I'm a dev. Uh, I, I don't understand the nuances of, of healthcare if we're, if we're building an app. Um, I need doctors. I need somebody who's been in health tech uh, to right. be a stakeholder on the project. We need people to anticipate the, the legal aspects. We need people to anticipate, um, you know, how, how it will impact real humans down the road, not just in six months, but in one year and five years and 10 years. Okay. Makes sense. Other questions? Um, I would say that I, that probably leads me down the rabbit hole of AI governance, making sure that we're actually, again, leading with governance um, proactively rather than reactively. Uh, sure. and, and define, define governance, please. Um, how are we implementing guardrails? How are we making sure that we're measuring um, aspects like fairness, like um, the amount of bias that we have in a system? Um, how are we making sure that we understand where our data came from? And if, if um, somebody asks for um, explainability, for example, are we building that up front so that we can try and make our models as explainable as possible? And part of the issues too, um, I think the rest of 2024 and, the next few years probably are going to be a wild ride for regulation and policy. Um, and how do we build, um, you know, technology doesn't have borders and yet we're going to get regulation and that does have borders. And so how do we as technologists, um, you know, handle that? Talk about national borders here. National borders, also state borders. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of different rules coming out of Colorado, out of California. And um, again, the internet might not have borders, but we're starting to implement them. So how do we, um, as we're developing, how do we make sure that we understand that? Michelle, when did you first become interested in this topic? Um, I started becoming interested in the ethics of AI in about 2018. Um, which is again now the kind of accepted term is responsible AI. Um, okay. I will say sometimes I do have an issue with that because uh, what does responsible mean? What does it mean to build responsible technology? What does it mean to build trustworthy technology? Um, what does it mean to build accountable technology? Um, sometimes these terms can be a bit subjective. Um, but uh, to go back to your question, um, I became interested in the ethics of AI and specifically in bias and measuring um Fairness, meaning uh, how can we make sure that our, our models are um, producing equitable outcomes across different groups and that they're not influenced by the prejudice of our data? And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, I, well, I was going to ask if, um, if it's changed in the last six years since you started studying this. Has our approach to it changed and should it change? I mean, we've, this, there has been a lot of hype around generative AI the last year or two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far as fairness goes, there's still a ton of research being done in the field. We haven't found a, a one solution yet. And, and, you know, there's not going to be one solution. There's, there's no free lunch, um, you know, as we say. Uh, yet there has been a lot of, of movement towards um, measuring bias, measuring fairness. Um, I think right now there's about 20, I don't want to say exact number, but mid 20s of uh, metrics around how do we measure fairness. Um, oh. And there's a, a lot of different approaches because we have to approach differently if we're dealing with um, you know, a neural network or now in terms of generative AI and how do we, how do we measure bias in a system like ChatGPT? Oh, how, how do we measure it? Can you give me an example of one of these metrics? Um, truthfully, um, I focus more on machine learning, but 
Um, there's okay. so many things that you can look at in terms of ChatGPT because it's it's a language model, right? Which means that it's been trained on our language. Um, what does our text, what does our language contain? It contains bias um, from things, you know, like tell me a story about an engineer and it's going to be a story of a male. Tell me a story about an engineer named Michelle and it's going to tell you a story about how an engineer named Michelle went up against the, you know, in a male dominated field, it'll never just be a story about, you know, an engineer, it's going to have that gender aspect in it. Same with a, a nurse who is male. Um, yeah. And, and some of those things are a bit more impactful. There's other silly biases, like, you know, you can ask it something along the lines of like, what's a Russian going to order at a bar, and it'll tell you vodka. Um, so there's, there's little things too, that are, are maybe, you know, silly to us or funny, but they, they come from an, an underlying bias. I guess so. Although la that last stereotype actually sounds kind of accurate. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that becomes another thing too, you know, um, uh, sometimes our stereotypes are grounded in truth, but when are they harmful? Correct. Yeah. Well, even the other one that you said, uh, if it assumes that an engineer is male and that's only because it's looked at all this historical data and engineering has been a male dominated industry and nursing has been a female dominated industry, at least in my lifetime. Uh, and even though those are that's less true today than it was 20 years ago, that's still the data it's looking at. So it is grounded in reality. Yeah, I would ask um, if we want to build systems that I mean, if we if we look at, let's say, prejudice, right, or bias, um, sure. that's wrong and harmful. Uh, that's an error, yeah. right? It's Correct. it's yeah. an error. It's a human error, but it's still an error. And if we seek to build accuracy, don't we want to understand the types of errors that we have that we're feeding it um, so that it can do better than us? Yeah, maybe that's the answer. Maybe just understanding the biases inherent in that data. You, you see, the dog agrees with me. Well, there are a lot of uh, advances recently. I think the, the one that has affected me most is ChatGPT has just created all sorts of interest in... Uh, generative AI. I mean, it's, it's actually the folks over at OpenAI have done an amazing job of building this thing, but they've also done an amazing job of just getting the word out to the general public. How has that changed things? Yeah, um, I would say it's been a wild ride for anybody working in AI the last um, few years. And what was really interesting about ChatGPT uh, in November of 2022 was not that the technology didn't exist. It did. You know, if you, if you wanted to interact with their API, you could you could um, hit the GPT models. Um, but what they did do was they created a UI for it. And in a lot of ways, it democratized AI, uh, which is, I think, wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. And also it made us move very fast. Uh, no one anticipated the public reaction as I think what was so surprising. And I, I think it's been wonderful in a lot of ways. It's driven a lot of excitement. It's driven a lot of you know, in some cases, just pure hype. Um, but it's really bringing the conversation uh, front and center. And uh, it's, it's a good place for us to be. Excellent. Um, before we go, I just want to say congratulations. I know you recently received a university degree. Tell us about that. Yeah, I am um, during the pandemic. Uh, I had a late night impulse to um, kind of formalize some of my, my thoughts and research on bias and fairness. And so I uh, applied to Hopkins. Um, they have a, a master's program for AI that was online. Um, mm -hmm. And I regretted that sorely at uh, various days <laughs> at four in the morning. <laughs> um, but uh, two and a half years later, it is done. Um, and it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, the program's wonderful. And um, I, I think they're going to have an even more solid program in the next few years. That's excellent. So Johns Hopkins University, which did, what degree did you receive? Uh, Master's of Science in Artificial Intelligence. Outstanding. And you're, as you point out, it's, it's like a second job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I was I was uh, relieved this May. It took me about two weeks, though, of still like the late night dreams that I didn't finish something um, or had a deadline. <laughs> so. I, st I still get those. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Michelle, thank you so much. This has been really educational for me. Thank you, David. Hope to see you soon.
friends. Don't let friends build irresponsible technology.